Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I serve as Vice President for Global Engagement and as Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown. And on behalf of our university community and the center, I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to this year's Berkeley Center Lecture with Professor Kathleen Caveney of Boston College, one of the world's leading scholars around critical questions of religion, law, and ethics. Kathy, we're so glad you can join us this afternoon to explore with us what Catholic ethics can contribute to American understandings of religious freedom. It's a topic that draws on your wide experience while also fitting nicely, I think, into the wider themes of our conference, both today and tomorrow, on challenges at the intersection of religion and human rights against the backdrop of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Dignitatis Humanae, the 1965 Declaration on Religious Freedom issued at the Second Vatican Council that will turn 60 this coming year. At a time when human rights and religious freedom are on the defensive around the world, when the very idea of universal human rights is under siege, still given lip service, of course, but attacked in its particulars on all sides in the name of contrasting ideological visions, we have an opportunity and an obligation to revisit the religious, philosophical, and ethical foundations of human rights as both a universal and as a global imperative. Now, our conversation these two days is unfolding, of course, as always, from a particular vantage point here in Washington, DC, on the eve of a, an historic election just two weeks away. And as we look abroad, the uneven, but I think undeniable, decline in US power in a shifting international system is certainly one of the drivers of today's increasingly contested global politics of human rights. Now, the United States will, of course, remain the single most powerful country in the world into the foreseeable future. But it, or we, for those of us who are Americans, must better learn to live with, listen to, and even learn from other countries more than in the past. That's a tall order, of course. But whether we like it or not, mainstream American understandings of universal human rights, centered on the civil and political rights of individuals, must more fully engage with other approaches into the future including the more generous attention to economic and social rights in the Universal Declaration and in the documents of Vatican II. Against the shifting global backdrop, competing understandings of religious freedom have grown particularly salient over the past decade, both domestically and internationally. And that's going to be our focus this afternoon. And we're really so fortunate uh, to have Kathy Caveney, Caveney with us to explore the ethics and politics of religious liberty with a particular focus on how engagement with Catholic social thought, a rich tradition with global reach, can contribute to understandings of religious freedom in the United States at a critical juncture in our domestic politics and in our foreign policy. Kathleen Caveney serves as the Darald and Juliet Libby Millennium Professor at Boston College, where she holds appointments in both the Department of Theology and the Law School. An eminent scholar across areas of ethics, law, and religion, she's published four major books in more than 100 articles and essays. I'll just share some of the titles of those path-breaking books, which I'm sure are familiar to many of you, titles which I think really provide a window on the breadth and depth of her research. Law's Virtues, Fostering Autonomy and Solidarity in American Society, A Culture of Engagement, Law, Religion, and Morality, and Prophecy Without Contempt, Religious Discourse in the Public Square. A public intellectual whose academic articles and leading journals and essays for a wider audience bridge scholarly and policy debates. Dr. Caveney also serves as a regular columnist for Commonweal Magazine. In addition to her engagement as a scholar and teacher, Kathy, I have to say Kathy, sorry, you yeah, know. 
Kathy has always also distinguished herself with a record of service to the profession or the professions when you think about all the disciplines that your work touches. She's chair of the Journal of Religious Ethics Board of Trustees and has served on other editorial boards, including the Journal of Law and Religion, and has also served as president of the Society of Christian Ethics in 2014-2015. A lawyer as well as a scholar, Kathy clerked for the Honorable John Noonan of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and remains today a member of the Massachusetts Bar. She began her academic career at Notre Dame, where she taught from 1995 to 2013 before moving to Boston College. Over the years, she served as a visiting scholar at the University of Chicago, Princeton, and Yale, as well as the 2018 Kerry and Ann McGuire Chair in Ethics in American History at the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. Kathy, uh, as many of us here know, you also have strong ties to Georgetown. You were a visiting scholar here back in 1998. Um, and since the center, the Berkeley Center, was founded in 2006, you've participated in many events, um, including just a couple of weeks ago, a celebration of the recent book by our colleague, Dr. David Hollenbach. We're really de delighted to have you here again uh, for two days and for this keynote and Berkeley Center lecture, uh, a lecture that touches on so many areas of your expertise. This is part of a series of Berkeley Center lectures that goes back some 15 years and has featured insights from leading thinkers on topics at the intersection of religion, peace, and world affairs, thinkers including Jürgen Habermas, Martha Nussbaum, and Charles Taylor. So thanks again for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you all for being here, and please join me in welcoming Kathy Caveney. Can you hear me? OK. It's a delight to be back at Georgetown. Uh, he's going to make sure you can hear me. And, uh, and uh, which I consider a second home. And uh, I, I do have to say that, uh, while you may not believe it, I actually did not pay Tom to write that too fulsome introduction. Um, I, I am very grateful um, for that. I'm also very grateful to have been invited to deliver the keynote address at this important conference, celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Patrick F. Healy Conference on Freedom and Man. I'm also quite humbled. Sitting in this room today, looking out at you all, are leading global experts on human rights, religion, and the interaction between these two spheres of personal commitment, social identity, and intellectual investigation. I am honored to be with you all, and I am excited and gratified to hear what you have said and will say about the challenges and opportunities facing us. So rather than attempting futilely and unnecessarily to duplicate all your good work, my goal this afternoon is to make a contribution to our common efforts by plowing my own particular patch of our field. I work at the intersection of American law and Catholic ethics. And like many of us here today, especially Catholics, I am proud that John Courtney Murray drew upon the American experiment with religious freedom in articulating and defending the position that with some modifications became enshrined in Dignitatis Humanae, Vatican II's Declaration on Religious Liberty. But as anthropologists tell us, gift giving is a reciprocal relationship. More than 50 years after Murray's distinctive American contribution to and challenge to the teaching of the Catholic Church on religious liberty, error has no rights, is the old way, I think that Catholic moral and social teaching can contribute to and challenge the prevailing understanding in the United States of religious liberty as articulated in recent Supreme Court decisions regarding the religion causes of the First Amendment. So here's the plan for the talk. 
In the first part, I will give what lawyers call a nutshell version of the American First Amendment. In the second part of the talk, I will try to investigate more deeply a couple of problems that have arisen from the current state of First Amendment jurisprudence um, that I think the Catholic tradition might offer some critical reflections upon. And I will call them the complicity problem and the comedy problem, not the comedy problem. I've got to pronounce my T's. That would be more fun, but that's for later, maybe. So let's start with a, a, a whirlwind tour of the religion clauses. Now, most of you know the first bit of the Bill of Rights to the American Constitution, conveniently known as the First Am Amendment, reads as follows. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I just wanted to flag that at the beginning because I think it's important to note that the First Amendment encompasses far more than the religion uh, pieces of it. And I think a, a topic for another day is how all of those pieces are related. But nonetheless, people call the first part of the First Amendment the religion clauses. And I'll just repeat that part for your convenience. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Well, what does that mean? People argue about it, and it has meant different things to different people at different points in history. So for my purposes here, I can only pull out a slice, a sliver of the broader debate, and I wanna focus on two rough periods where these uh, uh, phrases were interpreted. Uh, the first being the mid 20th century, roughly coinciding with the Vatican Council and the work of John Courtney Murray. And the early 21st uh, century, roughly coinciding well with now. So, give me a second. To give an overview, I'm going to look at the two bits of the First Amendment uh, religion clauses um, and uh, kind of dig a little bit into what they meant at each time period. So let's start with the mid 20th century view, which I think was overwhelmingly concerned with the problem of grappling with and containing pluralism mid 20th century, century, 60s to say late 80s. Uh, in the mid 20th century, the tacit presupposition of the free exercise clause was that it should be used to protect minority religious traditions which were unable to protect themselves in the public square. The tacit sense was that mainline religions were powerful enough to protect themselves. This was not pure doctrine, of course, but the cases that the Supreme Court with often had such protagonists. Seventh-day Adventists who did not want to work on their Sabbath, Saturday. Amish parents who did not wish to send their children to high school in violation of the contemporary uh, con uh, compulsory education laws, but they wished instead to educate them at home. Jewish men who wished to wear a kupa to work um, even when they worked in the armed services, and Native Americans who wished to practice their traditional religion, which on occasion included uh, smoking uh, substances such as peyote, which at the time were controlled substances. So that's what the free exercise jurisprudence of the time was focused on. What about the Establishment Clause? During this period as well, at least in my view, the court was concerned mainly to protect minority religions from impingement by majority traditions in the nation as a whole or in a particular area. There were two big foci of concern. First, public displays of religion in front of government buildings, the Ten Commandments, a creche, a menorah, what have you, some sort of religious symbol in front of a, a building like a town hall, 
Uh, and then the second was religion in the schools, either religious rituals in the public schools, prayer in school, or government aid going to religious schools. At the time, the test that was used and has now been officially discarded was called, uh, subject to great mockery, the lemon test. And under the lemon test, the idea was that any government action must not have either the intent or the primary effect of advancing or inhibiting religion. And second, there must not be excessive entanglement between the government and religion in the course of their relationship um, in the program that the government was sponsoring. So that's a whirlwind worldview, uh, or overview of the worldview. What are the presuppositions of that mid 20th century view? I think there were four. First, it presupposed there was a well-defined secular sphere, a public square that is neither neutral toward religion nor favorable, um, or that, excuse me, rather, that is neutral toward religion, not favorable and not hostile, that you would be able to have a neutral public square. Second, it presupposed that there was sufficient common morality that all people of goodwill share, whether or not they belonged to a particular religion. Third, it presupposed that a strong divide exists between public and public identities and the private realm and private identities. Religion, like sex, were matters that belonged in the private realm. And fourth, it presupposed that majority religions were able to fend for themselves, to protect themselves in many ways, and that the job of the courts, as I just indicated, was to protect underrepresented and vulnerable religious minorities. Well, that was then. This is now. And the basic assumptions I just uh, articulated to you no longer hold. There is no widespread sense today of a neutral secular space. The culture wars have meant that we no longer assume that there is a framework where believers and non-believers can operate on equal terms. Secondly, the idea of a common morality has been increasingly eroded. That notion, supported by pretty much everyone, regardless of their religious beliefs, or at least given lip service to it, had, has pretty much disappeared in the last 50 years, beginning with the tumult of the late 60s and continuing to the present time. Third, we are dealing with a weakened public and private distinction. Our boundaries between the public self and the private self have simply crumbled. Our era prioritizes bringing one's whole self into every context, including racial identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and religion. We now live, I think, in an age of identity. Fourth, I think there's a broad sense of grievance on the part of mainstream religious traditions, um, particularly those with conservative religious beliefs. They look at the disappearance of religious affinity um, in things like Pew study after Pew study, and they begin to be afraid. So how has this shift affected how we think about religion, free exercise, and establishment? Let's look at religion for a minute. If you look at the older cases, underlying many of them was the notion of religion as obligation. This is not surprising, after all, the word religion has a Latin root suggesting obligation, ligari. So many, obviously not all, but many of the free exercise cases had to do with situations in which a religious obligation to do or not do something conflicted with a secular law. Furthermore, those obligations were at least to some sense subject to an objective referent. At one point, for example, Catholics had a hard time for up, uh, applying for a religious exemption as pacifists because Catholic teaching supports just war theory, or did at the time, rather than pacifism. So people would say, look to your own catechism. You say you're Catholic, you know, put on your helmet. But within the broader framework of identity that's around us now, two different features have become highlighted. 
in religion clause jurisprudence. The first is integrity. The court, the recent Supreme Court, has been explicit that religion is a matter of living life according to a certain pattern of faithfulness, not merely complying with a certain set of norms specified in a catechism by a religious tradition. And the second is related. I call it sincerity or authenticity. The touchstone for whether a belief was protected as part of a religious framework is now really the believer's sincere commitment to it as part of their authentic identity. It is not anymore whether they are required by religious doctrine to do something. It is whether they feel themselves called to do it as part of the religious identity they are building for themselves. So that's what religion is now. Free exercise, how about that? Well, in this contemporary context, claims of free exercise of religion attracts more sympathetic uh, attention, even on the part of the powerful. For example, free exercise claims now are brought by members of majority religions, not merely minority religions. In Burwell versus Hobby Lobby stores, evangelical owners of a closely held corporation successfully argued that it was a violation of their free exercise rights to be forced to provide health insurance covering certain contraceptives that they believed were abortifacient, uh, 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 operated by causing uh, the, uh, the embryo to detach uh, from the mother's body. In Fulton versus Philadelphia, 2021, Catholic Social Services, which contracts with the city to provide foster care services, sued Philadelphia for violating their religious freedom by requiring them to place children with same-sex couples or unmarried couples. Now, these are interesting claims. In both these cases, I think, we are not dealing with strict religious requirements of the larger tradition. Catholic teaching does not actually prohibit placing children with same-sex parents. It would say that it is likely imprudent to do so in some cases, but it is not an intrinsically evil act or always wrong to place kids who are at risk in the best situation they can find, holistically considered. And Catholic charities have, in fact, placed children with same-sex and, unmar uh, and unmarried parents. Evangelical Protestantism, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a clear teaching on the status of the very early embryo or how certain contraceptives work. Moreover, um, uh, this situation doesn't involve performing an early abortion, but simply participating in a plan that covers it. We're going to get to that a little bit later. So why the problem? Both groups, in my view, believe three things. Their authenticity, their authentic identity as religious believers corresponded with the action they claimed was protected by religious freedom. The basic legal framework, second point, accepting same-sex marriage and abortifacient contraception, in their view was not neutral, but already in a value-laden way, uh, uh, something that was harmful to a religious worldview. It harmed their interests and threatened their integrity. And third, they believed they had a right to bring their full selves, which in their case meant their religious selves, into the marketplace and into engagement with the government. And the current Supreme Court has agreed with them. That's where we are. Moreover, the worry that conservative religious believers are somehow disrespected is palpable in some of the current Supreme Court jurisprudence. The court is very sensitive to any scheme that treats religious belief less favorable than any other voluntary activity in which people engage. And you could see that in their treatment of COVID cases, where if there was a supermarket open or a wine shop open, then you had to have the church open, despite the fact uh, that there might be some differences, such as singing, that might have made it a bit different. So that's religion in the new realm. That's free exercise in the new realm. Whatever happened to the Establishment Clause? 
It's too soon to be sure, but reading some tea leaves or Justice Gorsuch's recent opinions in cases like Carson versus Macon, I think the Establishment Clause will get folded into the Free Exercise Clause. Why would that be? Well, if there's no possibility of a neutral public square, the government is always at least potentially advancing a normative worldview that impinges upon somebody else's religious worldview. That cannot be helped, that there is no neutrality from this perspective. But if the government treats religious belief or activity in a less favorable manner than other beliefs or activities, it is demeaning that religion in order to establish its own view probably a normative secular worldview. Second, if the government adopts too wide a plan or public activity, which impinges upon religious belief or action more than it absolutely needs to, then it is in fact establishing its own worldview. Again, probably a normative secular worldview. Consequently, in this hermeneutical context, preventing the establishment of religion means giving as wide a scope to free exercise as possible. So that, in my view, is our legal situation today regarding the First Amendment, in a nutshell. But law and morality are distinct, although they're not unrelated. In a pluralistic society such as our own, I believe we need to ask ourselves, how ought we to exercise our broad rights to religious freedom, given the rights of other people, both to religious freedom and to other rights, such as women's reproductive autonomy and LGBTQ rights? We need to ask not what are our rights, or not only what are our rights, and how can we protect them to the extent possible, this is very hard in a litigious society such as our own. But what are other people's rights and how should we go about thinking about them and discerning what respect requires? I'm going to now turn to this big question and I'm going to argue that Catholic thought can help address two particular and emerging challenges of our current situation which as I indicated in the introduction, are called the complicity problem and the comity problem. So let's start with complicity. As I noted earlier, some of the most important recent religious liberty cases have involved matters of complicity rather than direct wrongdoing. For example, in Zubik versus Burwell, the Little Sisters of the Poor, a Catholic religious order, objected to including contraceptive coverage as part of a health care benefit package mandated by the federal government. Not only did they not want to provide such coverage, they did not even want to sign the form objecting to such coverage because in their view, doing so would trigger the insurance company reaching out to their employees. Note that the sisters are not directly giving women birth controls pills, nor are they dispensive contraceptives like a pharmacy. They are rather removed from the act of using contraception, quite removed in fact. In terms of traditional Catholic moral theology, which developed as a form of casuistry, trying to figure out concrete cases of right and wrong, they are involved in a situation of cooperation with evil. Now that's a rather infelicitous term used to describe lots of mundane situations in which our actions contribute in some way to the wrongful actions of another. If you live with people, if you support people, if you help people, you are in some sense going to be cooperating with evil in the sense that you're going to be giving your kid an allowance that they're going to be go spending on something, you know, like candy or something worse, who knows. You can't help it. But the word co cooperation with evil is just another technical term for complicity. But 
In his majority opinion in the Hobby Lobby case, Justice Samuel Alito invoked the doctrine of cooperation with evil, which actually also describes, although they were Protestant, the connection of Hobby Lobby to contraception. It's remote. Um, at the same time, he, removed, he refused to engage it. He just sort of said, well, there's this doctrine out there. We're just going to step back as far as we can and avoid it. But I think we can do better than this. I think we can think about cooperation with evil as a doctrine that both helps and challenges involvement in religious liberty cases. So what exactly is the framework of cooperation with evil? Well, more or less, it creates an elaborate grid to help people discern when facilitating the wrongful act of another is permissible and when it's not. There are lots of categories um, because it was sort of high casuistry. Moral theologians commonly that date the development of the framework to the 18th century in the work of the famed moralist St. Alphonsus Liguori. Now, without getting lost in the elaborate grid, which can rival the U.S. tax code in its complexity, we can note that the nuns' cooperation with the use of contraception by offering insurance plans covering birth control would be categorized as, now wait for it, remote material cooperation with evil remote material cooperation with evil. What does that mean? Well, the material part means that they don't intend for their employees to use contraception. Their intent simply is to provide a mandated benefit plan, which includes contraception among many other benefits. Moreover, they are fairly removed, as we discussed, that's the remote part, from the actual use of contraception. Traditionally, remote material cooperation is justified by a category called proportionate reason. Proportionate reason, it's in quotes. One might say that providing a government mandated benefit package, which makes contraception available as a medical matter but does not force it on anyone, could count as proportionate reason. The argument can be made without any updating of the doctrine of cooperation of, of evil with evil at all. Um, given the fact that uh, following the law, which is providing a good benefit overall, can justify cooperation uh, with a remote possible evil. So there you go. We don't need to update anything so far. But in my view, the doctrine does need updating for both sociological and doctrinal reasons recognized by the Second Vatican Council. The first reason is sociological, morally pluralistic societies. Vatican II, especially Gaudium et Spes and Dignitatis Humanae, has begun to recognize, well, what was long the case, but the modern world is pluralistic, not merely from country to country, but even within countries. Many of us live in religiously and moralistic, uh, morally pluralistic societies where there is deep disagreement about the nature of the good. If we live in such a society, if we support living in such a society, we will inevitably be facilitating what we consider to be objectively and sometimes seriously defective choices, just as others will inevitably be facilitating our choices, which they may view as defective. Our political, social, and financial lives are intertwined. That's what it means to live in a pluralistic society. If we take the doctrine of cooperation with evil too far, we fall prey to three major dangers uh, related to the situation we live in. First, and ironically, we will become functionally consequentialist because the most important things about our actions, and you could see this with the little sisters, will become the way they are tainted by, uh, by uh, the way they are taken up by other people for their actions. Second, we will be distorted in our consequentialism because we will discount the ways in which our actions contribute to other aspects of the common good. Third, and most problematically, we may functionally resist living in a pluralistic society and resort to creating enclaves without significant moral and religious pluralism, all so that our actions are pure in consequences. St. Mary's, Kansas, a town that has been transformed by the presence of the conservative society of St. Pius X, is one example. 
If you want to read about it, look up Emma Green's article in The Atlantic. But the general idea can also be found in Bill Bishop's The Big Sort, why the clustering of like-minded America is tearing us apart. But the problem is graver, I think, than a failure to grapple with what's required to live in a pluralistic culture. This stringent view of cooperation with evil fails to take seriously what it means to treat others as moral agents who are conscientiously responsible for pursuing the truth as they see it. Now, this is a hard line to draw. I don't deny it. I do not think we can say that any cooperation is justified as long as the person whose actions we are worried about contributing to subjectively believes it's okay. As scholars of human rights know, persons uh, and nations and groups all have thought that morally atrocious actions are permissible or even required. But there are a number of factors that can shed light on what proportionate reason means in a, pl in a pluralistic society. Let me specify three. Does the action physically harm anyone, especially third parties? Is the action a result of a, party, a policy that has been duly enacted by law? And third, does the policy help vulnerable people more broadly, even if there are objectionable features to it? So how does that apply to the Little Sisters case? Well, the action does not physically harm third parties. Contraception, properly understood, is not a, a, an abortifacient. The contraceptive mandate was not dreamed up um, for those uh, reasons, to harm people. Second, it is an attempt to implement federal legis legislation, the Affordable Care Act, which attempts to make a basic benefit package available to a wider swath of Americans who lack the basic right to health care. And third, the purpose was not to facilitate promiscuity, but to promote maternal fetal health. This is particularly important in the case of financially vulnerable women and babies. And there are studies that I can talk about that describe this if you'd like. So I think that the doctrine of cooperation with evil can help us understand the situation we are in with respect to the new religious liberty cases, but it also needs to be updated by the social justice tradition, particularly the ideas of uh, respect for dignity and, uh, and the phenomenon of a pluralistic society that we saw grappled with in uh, the Second Vatican Council. But there's also another problem. I call it the comity problem. The second major concern that Dignitatis Humanae raises for the new religious liberty litigation is, as I said, comedy. In a nutshell, it asks us to rise above our litigious society and ask not only what are we owed with respect to religious liberty, but what do we owe others with respect to their religious liberty claims. This point can seem too general to be of use, like a general injunction to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But I want to suggest that in pluralistic societies, there is a way to flesh this point out by considering one's role-related obligations. So I want to talk for a minute about cooperation with evil and role-related responsibilities. What we owe other people in society is in large part related to the role we play with respect to them. Assuming a role not only involves assuming duties, it also involves the tacit making of promises that others can and do justly rely on. This is not a hard concept for Catholic moral theology to, gra theology to grasp. It's implied in the tradition's affirmation that human beings are essentially social. But I'm going to go further here and argue that cooperation with evil analysis is generally, not always, but generally, blocked by role-related obligations. Let me give you three examples. We do not expect an emergency room doctor to refuse to heal a gang member because his actions are somehow facilitating the gang member's future wrongdoing. We do not expect a firefighter who is committed to the virtue of chastity to refuse to put out a fire at a strip club, even if she knows the disappearance of the club will strike a blow against promiscuity. 
And we do not expect a pilot to refuse to fly people to Las Vegas, despite the knowledge that many people will gamble if they go there, and won't if they don't. And gambling's a big social problem. So we have a distinct sense that role-related obligations can block cooperation with evil analysis. In our context, I think our debate about neuralgic issues tend to involve two roles, and I'll say something quickly about each. The first is employer, and the second is public accommodation. What does Catholic teaching say about our role-related obligations in each of these cases? Let's look at employer. The Little Sisters of the Poor are not simply vowed religious, they are also employers. What do employers who employ people of different faiths and commitments owe to their employees? One might say, according to Catholic teaching, a fair wage and health care. Well, let's look at a fair wage for a second. Given the breadth of contract law, there's actually little to stop the little sisters or any other employer from contractually requiring their employees to refrain from purchasing certain things or refrain from doing certain things on pain of losing their job. You can do that. It's not great, but you could do it. Um, certain cases it makes sense, for example, if you're the spokesmodel uh, for a, a vegetarian restaurant, you might be required, say, not to eat meat. Um, because that would get in the way of the business promotion. But it, would it be fair, would it be just for employers on a widespread basis to restrict the conscientious decision-making of their employees, say, about using alcohol, smoking cigarettes, or other activities, which are actually proven to harm both the individual and the common good? Probably not. Part of respecting an employee as an adult with a conscience of their own, is not imposing such restrictions on them. What about health care? Well, we speak of health care as an employee benefit, and it can seem as if it's just a gift that floated down from heaven. But it is not a gift. It is not even a benefit. It is part of an employee's compensation. With some limits, neither employers nor employees pay taxes on health care benefits provided through work. More broadly, health care in the Catholic tradition is a right. Given the structure of Catholic health care today in the U.S., which is largely employer insurance-based, we can say that a basic benefit package is what is owed to people in virtue of both their dignity and the vulnerability. The content of that benefit package needs to be negotiated in a democratic society, but once the benefits are set as a specification of what we owe vulnerable and dignified human beings, there should be a very high bar to opting out. So that's employment. The second kind of situation in which people may face complicity issues is if they own or operate public accommodations. If I own a public accommodation, I will be facilitating all sorts of behavior I might not be morally comfortable with. I will be renting hotel rooms to people that may not be married. I will be serving dinner to people planning sharp business transactions. I will be driving people to who knows where to what sorts of ill-conceived behavior. But a public accommodation's scope and meaning cannot be determined only by its owner or operator. It has a broader social meaning in two senses. First, the mere fact that businesses, um, often corporations, are allowed to operate is something that is decided by the community through the Secretary of State's office. To have a business, to have a corporation, is to have a social status very frequently. Secondly, the business mediates not only or primarily the values of the owner, but also the values of the community, including the social standing of the peoples who patronize it. This insight gives us a way to understand what is a case like Masterpiece Cake Shop and uh, 303 Creative versus Alanis, both of which involved evangelical Christians who refused to be complicit in same-sex weddings because of their religious belief. As is not a surprise to you at this point, in terms of Catholic theology, they were engaged in very remote material cooperation. They were not performing the wedding or providing services essential for the union. They were pretty much providing uh, ancillary services for the party and the advertisement. So as we noted before, remote material cooperation is justified by proportionate reason. Given the developments in Dignitatis Humanae and Vatican II more generally, 
What could count as proportionate reason for going ahead with this sort of thing with respect to their status as public accommodations? I can think of two reasons. First is social respect. Both plaintiffs said they were not opposing LGBTQ people, but merely weddings. They would design other websites or bake cupcakes for them in other situations. But as I indicated earlier, certain attributes of people, including sexual orientation, have gone over the years from being incidental aspects of a, a person's identity to core aspects of that identity. Failing to socially respect a core aspect of a person's identity is seen as as, as, as dismissing or demeaning them. But who gets to say what's a core aspect of identity? Now, this is a very hard question. But there's a second point that's relevant here. These arguments are worked out not on an idiosyncratic basis, but through the society as a whole, including through its civil rights laws. And our society has extended social dignity through the rule of law to these groups. So reasonable reliance on law is another point. The argument on behalf of core identity is strengthened when the law intervenes to indicate that certain aspects of a person's makeup belong to an identity deserving social respect. It creates reasonable reliance on the part of the protected class. Being denied social respect in this situation is doubly troubling. It is not simply being deprived of something wa that one wants and thinks one should have, like a short kid being deprived admission to the roller coaster, not that that ever happened to me at all. <laughs> but it is also the equivalent of being shamed. Well, what about a counter argument, endorsement? The plaintiffs may respond that the argument about social respect is a bug, not a feature. In fact, they may protest, in fact, they have protested that they do not morally respect the probity of same-sex relationships. But drawing inspiration from both Murray and Dignitas, Dignitatis Humanae, I want to claim a distinction between social respect and moral agreement. Murray maintains that the Constitution is to be interpreted as articles of peace rather than a full-blown political theory. In an increasingly pluralistic society, I think we need to shore up a realm of what I call, for lack of better phrase, public manners. Public manners requires social respect. And so, in my view, does the anthropology of dignitatis humanae. I can respect you as a child of God, tasked with following your informed conscience without agreeing with the dictates of your conscience. At the same time, I can perform my role-related obligations to you without you morally assuming, or without you assuming that I morally agree with your choices. In other words, I can have respect for your social identity as it is shaped in and by our society by fulfilling my role-related obligation, by, but still maintain that the descriptor of key aspects of your identity are in some respect inadequate. But at the same time, this will not be enough. And we can sense we are in a time of crisis. To address this crisis, I think we need to do three things. First, as I just said, we need to show social respect for those with moral uh, and religious views that are different from ours. Second, as I just said, we need, to respect, we need to understand that social respect does not mean that we morally agree with others. But third, we need to recognize, and this is the key, that it is good that we are all here. This is the big challenge I think we face and that Catholic ethics and theology chase faces. Dignitatis humani, and this is the conclusion, recognizes the intrinsic value of each individual's search for truth in accordance with the demand for conscience. But I am not so sure that it, in, it sees a morally and religiously pluralistic society as an intrinsic good in itself. And we hold these truths, published in 1960, John Courtney Murray offers a largely pragmatic defense of the First Amendment and American pluralism based on experience. We've proven that political unity is possible without uniformity of religious and belief, belief and practice. He says, and this is a funny one, stable political unity, which means perduring agreements on the common good of man at the level of performance, can be strengthened by the exclusion of religious differences from areas of concern allotted to government, public-private distinction. 
And he says, the third and most striking aspect of the American experience consists in the fact that religion itself, and not least the Catholic Church, has benefited by our free institutions. Well, from my perspective, it's not entirely clear that these pragmatic arguments hold today. We need principled arguments for the value of a pluralistic society, not simply pragmatic one. To end then, I will turn to another Murray, a distant relative, John Murray Cudahy, whose book uh, from 1978, No Offense, Civil Religion and Protestant ta Taste, continues to be instructive. He writes, we have seen how the story of religion in America involves two phases. An early cognitive phase in which each religion on arrival learns of the existence of diverse other religions and accommodates to them in a provisional, grudging, utilitarian way. A little bit like the pragmatic approach. As one acknowledges a physical obstacle in the, in the situation of one's intended action. And later, an ethical phase in which this diversity and pluralism is gradually, internally accepted as something not only inevitable, but also right and meaningful and good. What was merely descriptive of an external situation becomes normative and religiously legitimate. The change is from, you are there and we are here, to, it is good for all of us to be here. And that is the task, I think, for American Catholics and for other religious believers in America today. We need to make the case that it is good for all of us to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Kathy, for that brilliant talk. Very thought-provoking on multiple levels. We do have some time for conversation before our reception. I did want to take the privilege of maybe asking the first question. Sure. I'm very sympathetic to, to the idea that um, the Catholic tradition must embrace a deeper conception of pluralism. In other words, in a conversation around religious freedom, I think there's a degree of being comfortable with religious and cultural pluralism, but this new threshold of ethical pluralism, as you call it, is much harder for the tradition to grapple with, a tradition that's been built up historically around core principles like human dignity, solidarity, and the common good. What are some resources you see within the Catholic tradition, you touched on some of them, maybe you could go deeper, for a positive embrace of ethical pluralism? because th that is a difficult challenge. Yeah. I, I think that is the hardest challenge, and that's obviously what we're facing now. Um, I think there are two levels at which you have to operate in order to do this. So this is a book that somebody needs to write, you know, I mean, and probably not me tonight. But the first thing is, you know, kind of the epistemic value for moral wisdom and knowledge of being in a deeply pluralistic society. What do we learn not only from reading books about other people's lives, but actually being with people who are, have configured the world you know, in, in, in a different way and see their obligations in a different way. Um, and so I think that focusing on that, I think, is important. So it's not just articles of peace, I would say, to, to, um, to uh, John Courtney Murray. I'd say it's articles of moral wisdom. So we need to think of the Constitution as giving us articles of moral wisdom. That's the first point. And the second point, um, and I, I think of David's work here, you need some wisdom to, to, you know, to decide. Uh, one of, I, I was privileged to, hear, you know, to be here for the launch of David's most recent book. And one of the most troubling aspects of the book, but provocative aspect of the book, was distinguishing between you know, certain ways that violence against women has been configured in the world. And you distinguish between situations where, um, 
where you know you've got rape uh, as a tool of war and terror, that kind of violence against women. And then in other religious traditions, th there is a, there is a sense that female, uh, you know, what we would call female circumcision, is, is somehow empowering for women. That's very hard for me to accept as a Western woman. Um, um, but at the same time, I think I have to be able to enter into their framework to sort of see how it all operates. And, and part of what's at stake there is that it's not an effort, you know, at least on the part of the women who are running this or some of this, to demean women, but to empower them. So like when I think the little sisters look at the package of, you know, healthcare, what I'd want them to say is like, this is part of a big picture. It isn't just about contraception. It's about providing access to a broad package of healthcare that will actually help mothers and babies. So looking at ends, looking at motives, and being contextual about how we analyze harm. If Thanks. that helps. Thanks, and I would, I would reference here to Pope Francis's uh, focus on encounter. Exactly. And a culture of encounters, sort of acknowledging the deep divides that exist, but uh, coming at them with a, a spirit of generosity and humility, which I think is in the spirit of your presentation too. So we have some time for conversations. We have a couple of roving mics. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, uh, please raise your hand. And especially if you want to give an answer, that would yeah. be better. <laughs> Here. And please, um, please introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah, Edward Grant. I'm at the uh, Pellegrino Center for Clinical Ethics here. Hi. Um, I'll try to, three points, but very briefly. I, I wonder if you've considered uh, Murray's thought regarding the Establishment Clause. I mean, he was virulent, I would say, in his own measured way about the Everson and McCollum decisions. Uh, he wrote prolifically on the school question as a question of distributive justice uh, that Catholic schools should receive aid because of the public service they were providing. Uh, and he was very clear that the push towards privatization, which I, I think the risk in your thesis is basically that we can hold these beliefs that abortion is intrinsically evil. I, I was concerned with your reference to it as reproductive rights of women. I mean, that is just out of bounds in Catholic, if it, to the extent it embraces abortion. That's just completely out of bounds. Uh, Vatican II was very clear on this, and all, all the popes since Vatican II have been very clear on this. Um, so I, so I, I think there is a tendency to in, in your critique of where the court has gone, that we should just go back into the closet, have our beliefs, but we can't impose them. And I think the, the final point I'll make is, this is the government going after people. I mean, uh, the, the, the push against Jack Phillips by the state of Colorado for 10 years is egregious. And maybe you have a different view of that, but there's plenty of bakers who will bake cakes for weddings. He's targeted, and other people of that belief system have been targeted. Um, going after the Little Sisters of the Poor, given who the Little Sisters of the Poor are and what they do, uh, seems to be an excessive overreach on the part of the federal government. I mean, and, and you mentioned the, the, the town in Kansas. I, I think I read that, art, uh, that article, but what is the difference between that and a yeshiva devoted community, and there are several of them in New York State? Um, where it's, you know, the town is, you know, the public schools are essentially Jewish schools or sort of turn into that. So anyway, those are just some thoughts. I think pluralism demands a respect for the kind of people I'm talking about. So I, I guess I would have just three quick responses. One, um, when I talk about reproductive rights, I'm talking about how other people are framing the issue who are in the pluralistic society. So I'm using their language. Um, I, I agree with you that abortion is a different situation because I think any time you end up harming, oh sorry, I tend to walk. Um, any time you end up harming somebody, you've got a different calculation. So that's point one. Point two, um, I think you've shifted the question slightly. What I'm trying to do is to discern when and how Catholics taking into account their whole tradition should protest. They've got the rights. The Little Sisters won. 
you know, uh, Master P. Cake one, 303 Alanis one, the Supreme Court is, you know, 6-3 for the foreseeable future. So the focus of my talk was saying, well, what does the tradition tell us about when we should exercise this right and not, given what we know, uh, given what we owe other people? Um, so that was what I was trying to look at. Um, I'm developing it from within, given the new um, piece of... Uh, the, you know, the, the new situation with respect to religious liberty jurisprudence. On, on, on some of this, um, what's the difference between a yeshiva and, 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 and a little town called St. Mary's? Well, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not a, an expert in, in, in the Jewish tradition, so I don't, um, I, I don't want to um, speak for that. But I think uh, after the Second Vatican Council, um, even if they can do it, I think there are a lot of good reasons, which I tried to explain and to call for the explanation, of why Catholics should not separate themselves from the broader community. So that's what I was trying to make, a moral argument. Can they do it? Yeah, it's there. I mean, I don't know to what degree they can do it, but can they do it? And on school choice, I'm much more conflicted. I am a Catholic, but I am the child of a public school principal, and, um, and I see a great value in public education. And while I see value in parochial education as well, I, I don't agree with Murray all down the line on that. Let's come up to the front here for the next question. Thank you, Kathy, for a wonderful talk. So I have, I have a question and a idea for maybe where we can go or for the, the kind of the ethical pluralism at the end um, that, you, that you mentioned. On the question, um, so you talked about cases where, like the Little Sisters of the Poor. My question is about the propensity we're seeing of the use of that kind of interpretation of religious freedom, particularly often by Catholic institutions, to claim the religious freedom to violate their own religious tradition. Right. right. That's sort of what I was arguing. And so, right, we see this in the union busting and um, not Georgetown. I can, right, I feel no qualms about actually raising this question here, but many, many other Catholic higher education, hospitals, and the like that try and push and try and claim religious freedom as a way for them to block unionization by their workers, which, quite frankly, right, the claim that my religious freedom means I get to violate my religious principles on the one. Um, so that's, that's my question. Um, but my kind of point to where we might go, uh, as you were talking at the end, what struck in my mind is a, the confluence of examples out of South Africa. Um, and so I think of the way in which Gandhi's experience in, a, in South Africa influenced him and the way Gandhi influenced Martin Luther King Jr. Um, as well as the what we get if we look more broadly at Christian ethics, the work done by people like Desmond Tutu in order to inhabit multiple traditions um, as where we might find points of hope, an example of where you actually do have traditions learning from each other in which they're not agreeing on everything and they don't, they don't set out to agree on everything. Right. I, I, mean, I think that that's very helpful and, and I am I'm acutely aware, you know, Jane McAuliffe sitting here, that there are experts in other religious traditions here that, you know, have devoted their lives to doing that. And I think ethicists need to spend more time talking to people um, who have that expertise. On the, you know, I, I separate law, I mean, I, I know it's so tempting to say, well, the law should go in and do what I think is right in all cases, and I'm not saying you're saying that, but, you know, so on the union thing, I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, cases like Hosanna Tabor and that we're trying to avoid was sort of excessive entanglement between religion and, um, and, and the government. That's still sort of a problem. Secondly, as the court, when it's looking at religious freedom cases, has moved more to the subjective, sincerely believed standard, you know, we can talk about what happened to the, you know, 
the, the, the religious freedom test, but it's really, do you sincerely believe it? They're very much not, you know, investigating what the tradition involves. They're going to say, well, I'm not going to say what the Catholic tradition involves. I just, you know, that's, that's theology. Look, I'm not going to touch it, you know. So there is a benefit to that kind of distance, but we can hold people accountable. And, 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 and one of the things that I think is important for you know, Catholic colleges and universities is to run these arguments to say, hey, yet there is cooperation with evil. Justice Alito, you shouldn't have just put it in a footnote. Here's how we can do it. Here's how we can develop it. And it's a very useful tool in a pluralistic society. I think you let me have it first. Thank you very much. That was really rich and thought-provoking. Um, it actually reminded me of, and I'm sorry, I can't get it off the top of my head. I didn't bring the book with me. Um, the book on the conference we're celebrating, I was really struck by a small passage where John Courtney Murray's introduction says something to the effect, it was the second part I remember really well, something to the effect of, uh, you know, this discussion of freedom propose presumes something like a, a commitment to the common good of society. What I remember, well, it is not for a society rent by hatred dist uh, distorting the body politic. So that, I think, gets to your last point. We have to believe that it's good that we are here together. I think that, I mean, I, I agree with you. And when I read some of John Courtney Murray in preparation for this conference, and the preconditions of, you know, social respect and, and uh, you know, non-divisiveness he, he thought of as, uh, as, as, as essential for his project. You know, you look around and you say, well, okay, what are we going to do? Um, I think the culture wars um, and the appropriation of the religious framing of the culture wars uh, by secular political interest has not done us any good in this framing because, as I've written in other works, you know, it creates a dualist mindset where what you see is the one point on which you disagree and not all the many points on which you might be able to collaborate. Sorry, the question oh, I was going to get to is because I like that part of your talk so much, and it reminds me of what David was talking about, the right to self-defense, one of the challenges of that idea is that it's really scary to make room for others to affirm that it's good that they are here for fear they will not return the favor and think that it's good for us to be here. I think that's an underlying issue, and I think that might get us back to some of that question of how religion, uh, from last the discussion of the panel, how religion can help support these rights. One of my colleagues who teaches in Islam refers to the belief that God made us different so that we could get to know each other. But there is that fear rooted in a desire for self-defense underlying that I think we'll have to deal with. I think that that's very important, yes. Take um, up here, and then David, and then a final question there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close and have more informal conversation over the reception. Please, yeah. Thank you for your remarks. Can you hear me through the mask? Yes. Um, I'm Allison McKinney Tim. I'm coming from a liberal Protestant perspective, but deeply interested in the issues you're addressing and the, the connection between Christianity and human rights. And I was really intrigued by the comedy problem that you raised and sort of this issue of uh, when religious actors realize that this is not just about asserting our own rights to religious freedom, but also respecting the rights of our fellow citizens to religious freedom. Um, and I think we talk sometimes about the risks of selfish individualism in using the human rights framework. And it strikes me that that seems like a fruitful sort of entry point to underscoring perhaps your point with comedy. Um, and, and maybe the question here is how do you see it relate to that sort of balance between asserting our rights and meeting our responsibilities to respect others' rights? Um, and the last sort of piece of this is it also strikes me that it would be easier perhaps for us to think this way if we could imagine being in the minority position 
or if we had some counterexamples to sort of spark our imagination about what it would mean, for instance, if I needed um, a, a heart transplant, but the surgeon is Hindu, and he wants to know if I'm vegetarian, what would that experience be like? Right. Do you see some sort of creative thinking in that direction to maybe help us with the comedy and to help us be more sensitive to our, our fellow citizens? That's a great question. And I think your idea of examples and, and, and cases, I love the casuistical tradition because I think it brings things down to the ground. So, you know, role reversal is important. And I, I, I suppose if, if I'd like you to take away, you know, how do we think about what our duties to others are? Well, we are not merely religious people. We are religious people, but we also inhabit roles that other people in society rely on, or we offer public accommodation that conveys public respect. So I, I think if we even just start thinking there, what does that mean? And then thinking about our own identity. I mean, I, I don't believe, I'm not a moral relativist. I am, I, you know, I, I, I'm not. I, but, but I don't think that granting social respect to somebody means that I necessarily am signing off on every jot and tittle about how you, how you lived your life. So we protect ourselves by also shoring up the meaning of our social actions, you know, so we don't have to feel threatened if we you know, rent a hotel room to an unmarried couple that we're endorsing fornication, say, for example, or whatever issue you want from the mid-20th century manuals that John Courtney Murray would have read. So we need to rethink these things in, in specificity, um, but also to think about our roles. Thank you. David? Thank you very much. It's on. It's on, OK. You can hear me? Thanks very much, Kathy, for a wonderful talk. And I, I, this is about your last point on comedy and the, the desire to be able to affirm that it's good that we're all here. And I take it that means all of us from diverse religious traditions and so forth. There's a remarkable statement uh, in the document issued by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar the document of human fraternity, in which he says that religious pluralism is willed by God. It's, that may not be an exact that's quote, but it's along yeah. those lines. And that's a very extraordinary statement. Yeah. It, it can't mean that God is a relativist, right. that God thinks everything is just equally good and equally bad. What does it mean, though? And that's, it certainly means God thinks it's good that we're all here, diverse, di di despite diversity. But it also means that it seems to me that we have to reflect upon how we think about religious diversity, not simply as how to get along with those other people out there, but what does it mean to relate to them positively and to take their religious experience seriously? And the Council, Vatican II, in, in the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, talks about rays of truth being contained in all, virtually all religious traditions. And it doesn't say all religions are equally true, but it does say that there's truth in all religions. And, and that means that there, so th this is a way of, of saying that getting into this question that you're arguing about there at the conclusion of your talk strikes me as being an area that we need a lot more reflection. Exactly. And I agree with you on that very much. And how to reflect on what it would mean when the Pope says it's good that God wills all religious, wills religious pluralism, what can that mean? And that we need a lot more reflection on that. And I think you opening up this comedy question is one way of saying that it has moral dimensions, but it has more than moral dimensions. It has a lot of serious religious and theological dimensions too. And I, 
I, I don't have the answer to where we go with it, but it's an important challenge. Thanks. And the thing we face in the U.S., of course, it's one thing to say that, you know, it's great that the Muslims are over there and the Hindus are here, and, but, but, but we in America are saying we are all here together. It is good that we are here. So I think a challenge for American Catholics, um, you know, and, and also by extension, you know, people who live in pluralistic societies, is to make the case for that goodness that's not just, well, pragmatic, or at least we're not killing each other, or, you know, um, something of that sort. Okay, final, final question here. Thank you very much. I'm Peter Petkov. I uh, had the humble uh, privilege to open uh, the, I heard your talk, and um, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, like Father David, I wanted to uh, join the line and ask you about your concluding remarks, which I found very interesting, particularly looking into the whole question of whether it's good to have a moral plurality in terms of an oversight of plurality um, in society. And uh, there, there was something within Dignitatis Humanae which did potentially set a minefield in this respect because I know. the understanding was that uh, it is good to have this plurality uh, as long as you have a state which oversees its navigation because we all have a monopoly on truth and therefore religious actors cannot manage religious freedom. You need to have a state which manages plurality of religious freedom and choices because the state doesn't have um, this uh, claim on absolute truth. Uh, and, and in a sense, that reflected an understanding of the state in the 60s. Right. And, and I was just wondering whether you would be able to speculate further how are we facing the current challenges of emerging moralist states which claim almost something which I could describe as a religious exceptionalism, like an American right. re exceptionalism w with a headscarf <clears throat> or with a religious dress. And how do you see moving beyond that? A moral state, which cannot be a, a moralist at all, or something else which addresses this conceptual deficit which was not really resolved with Dignitatis Humanae? Right. I mean, I think that that's right, and I'm not sure what is going to happen. But the idea, in, at least in American jurisprudence, and I think you know that there is a neutral framework that's being imposed by the state. The state is, is pretty much, at least by the federal government, is 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 no longer dominant. I think in First Amendment jurisprudence, at least the recent cases I see. What I'm afraid of, and some people may think this is a good thing is that, um, well, you know, the First Amendment, if we've got originalist jurisprudence, uh, you know, dominating here, and, you know, what were people thinking at the time of the framers? And I cut out the first part of my already too long talk, but it talked about how, you know, uh, the First Amendment really, you know, applied only to the federal government, and states had their own established religions. And there have been some hints and some discussions that people would like to go back to that, or at least some people want to go back to that, and that's part of the big sort. So I think you know, those of us who like a pluralistic society, um, or at least with some pluralism or some give, maybe we need more uh, nuance about what that word means, need to begin making the case for that, um, you know, why we shouldn't some of us go to Kansas, some of us go to Las Vegas, and, um, and then have, you know, uh, I don't know, Greek mythology declared and, you know, Zeus declared in Las Vegas and, and Catholicism in Kansas, or Oz. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kathy, in conclusion, this, this uh, catchy phrase, it's good that we're all here. Uh, did you borrow that? I quoted it. So who's, who, remind John us. John Murray Cudahy, which I think is one of the most uh, important books uh, of the yeah. late 70s. Uh, no offense. I'd love to do a conference on that in case anybody's yeah. looking. Yeah, it's a remarkable phrase. I mean, it, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the election coming up yeah. is really on all our minds. So I'm glad we, we touched on this important issue of comedy 
at such a critical juncture in U.S. politics and in world affairs. Thank you all for coming. I also want to, just uh, before we thank Kathy appropriately, just a, a word of thanks too to the Berkeley Center team for their work on the conference. My colleague, Michael Kessler, executive director for his work in putting everything together, including the keynote. I want you all to come back tomorrow, spread the word about the conference as the conversation continues. We'll have some time for informal conversation now over our reception. Thanks again for coming and please join me in thanking Kathy. Thank <laughs> you.